This is the Homeschool Show from North Carolinians for Home Education. Our goal is to help you homeschool with confidence and joy. I'm your host, Matthew McDill. We welcome you to the show today. And I want to welcome again uh, Rhonda Marshall into the studio as our co-host. Glad to be here today. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. How about we switch it around and I say what's going to happen in the show and then you do the news. Okay. I think I can do that. Okay, let's do it. (laughs) So we're going to start with the news, and the first thing is we're going to update you on what's going on with the Thrive Conference that's coming up next year. Then we'll have the homeschool tip of the week, which is go to the Thrive Homeschool Conference. And then we'll have homeschool conversations, and we're going to take another portion of my conversation with Dr. Brian Ray from the National Home Education Research Institute, where we talk about the importance of research and how we respond to uh, some of the attacks on homeschooling right now. And then we're going to have a special segment in which I'm going to discuss how we can preserve our values through home education. And then we'll end it up, as usual, with the homeschool reality moment, where Amanda's actually going to let us see into her kitchen on a regular homeschool day. She's very brave, right? Yeah, you're going to do that one next, Rhonda? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) All right, tell us the the news then today. Okay, so every year NCHE hosts the Thrive Homeschool Conference, and that may be news to some of you, um, but the big news today is that the website for the 2022 conference is now live, and you can go see that at nchegcom slash thrive. This conference will be May 26th through 28th in Winston-Salem, and we want you to be there. Plan on it. We have knowledgeable and inspiring speakers, a huge vendor hall, so many things, yeah. <laughs> engaging children's programs, a fun and educational teen um, activities, entertaining talent showcase. That That's amazing. I can never imagine all the things they yeah, put in there. It's always fun to watch that. Yeah, and then we also have an informative college fair. We have regional gatherings. We also have special group gatherings, so like for single parent homeschoolers, parents with young children, special needs, all those Military, kind of things. Military, grandparents, yeah. multicultural. So many. So special group gatherings and also homeschool mentoring. And if you would like to be a vendor at our vendor hall, we would love for you to apply or you can apply to be a speaker. Those applications are also now open and you can find them on nche.com forward slash thrive. For questions about the conference, you can contact Debbie Mason, who is our events um, director, and you can reach her at events at nche.com. So that's pretty easy for us to move right into the tip. The tip is important, yeah. Which is go to the conference. That's right. Go to the Thrive Homeschool Conference. Right. And if you haven't gone, why haven't you gone? Because you really need to be there. Seriously, this is not some snarky advertisement of some sort, but we are a nonprofit. And what we do is for you and for homeschool families. And this is one of the very best things that you can Mm -hmm. do to find the information, the encouragement, the resources, and the fellowship that you need to do the best job homeschooling your children. Um, And we have a video of a homeschool parent that I met, um, Diane Smith, and I met her at our mom's retreat, which was just last month, talking about how important the Thrive Conference has been to her and her family. So let's take a look. Great, let's watch it. Hi, I'm Diane Smith. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and we are in our fifth year of homeschooling. My first experience with NCHE was actually um, when my daughter was about to uh, enter pre-K and we were thinking about homeschooling but weren't sure and we found out at the very last minute that um, it was free for me to attend and that was a huge uh, blessing because uh, it was tight with us with our finances and we happened to have family friends that lived in Winston-Salem and so I was able to stay for free Um, and it was just a wonderful experience of lots of just what I do. I've never done homeschooling before Um, and there were so many wonderful speakers that gave such great encouragement Um, and then of course everyone knows the vendor hall is fabulous and so I got to look and touch and feel all of the different things that were out there. A little bit much but it was still good to see it all Um, and I am a visual learner so I really appreciated that and I just left with a sense of encouragement um, and was excited for whatever journey God was going to place us on with our homeschool and we have continued to return um, every year since and my husband and I make it kind of like a date thing um, when we go 
go and we do some of the uh, events together and some of them separate and we meet back together and do the vendor hall and then we go on a little date afterwards and then some sail off um, and really just enjoy that time together as a couple um, and as a team. He's the principal and I'm the teacher for our homeschool um, and we have really appreciated everything that NCAG has done for us to encourage and equip us. So that was, was Diane Smith. Yeah, Sorry. I love that. And um, I met her at the mom's retreat. So plan on going to that next year. So Matthew, what's your favorite part of the conference? Hmm. My favorite part of the conference. Well, I usually do enjoy the keynote sessions mm -hmm. because the keynotes are reserved for those national speakers that are right. really good, have mm -hmm. great content. I love those. And I love meeting people. So... I go into the vendor hall, but sometimes it's to hang out, you know? Yes. So I go find people, and there, there are a lot of people that I only see at the conference. So I really enjoy that. Yeah, I enjoy that too. My favorite part, um, well, I know for a lot of years, one of my kids' favorite parts was going to the teen program. Mm -hmm. They look forward to it every year and really enjoyed that. I just love to go and put my hands on things in the yeah, vendor hall. Sure. <laughs> and I just love to not feel... Like, I'm alone in the homeschooling. So right. going and seeing this mass of people gives me courage. That, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. You have this sense, especially, like I said, in the keynote, and the room's packed full of people, and they all want to learn. They all want to grow. They have all these workshops, and the vendor hall is full. Um, yeah, it's really exciting to see that there are so many people doing it with I you. I know. And why do you think people should go to the conference? Well... You know, I think one of the ways I heard someone talk about it recently is this idea of continuing education. You know, you go into a field, a job, things like that, and you can't just go stale with only what you know. Exactly. You know, and so there's this idea of getting refreshed. Um, and the fact is your kids are always growing. You know, you might be doing elementary school and you might be doing well with that. Mm -hmm. Middle school is different. And man, when you hit high school, you need more information. You oh, need something yeah. different. So there's so many um, different seasons, right? And I think keeping yourself fresh and inspired and encouraged and getting the new information is really critical. I agree. And one of the things I remember there's been a number of people over the years that I've encouraged to go and they don't go either because of money or whatever, or just taking the time without fail. Every time someone has gone and then come back, they've been like, Oh, I get it. Why you're so I can't excited. I can believe I haven't been yes, going to this. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to encourage you guys make the time, That's take, right. um, take the time to plan to go and you will be blessed and encouraged and helped in the journey. Cause we all need help. We all need right. help. And I, like you always looked at it too, as it's my teacher training. Yeah. So I go and whatever season I am, I go to those talks. I also make sure to not just do nuts and bolts, but also, um, some inspirational ones. And I just, I always feel so much better right. after going to the conference. It's and amazing. I really love what you said that while, Obviously, we're hosting this conference. I just want to reemphasize this really is the tip of the week. In other words, this isn't just an advertisement. Just like you said, we're a nonprofit. We're doing all of this for you anyway. And, right. uh, and this conference is what really drew me into NCHE and allowed me to get hooked. And I went every year since. I've never missed since that first one. See? It hooks you. Yep. So go to the Thrive Conference. I'll hope to see you there. Okay, so let's go on into our homeschool conversation. Today we're going to listen to another portion of Matthew's interview with Dr. Brian Ray. He's the president of the National Home Education Research Institute. That's right. And again, we were at the uh, National Leaders Conference, uh, one of the National Leaders Conference for Homeschool uh, Leaders. And we sat down and talked. In this part, I really was talking to Dr. Ray about the importance of research. And we also talked about some of the threats uh, that we're facing in the homeschool community nationally, which also apply to North Carolina. And it was very insightful to know how can we respond to those arguments and what worldview um, do these people have that are that are coming against or wanting to regulate uh, homeschooling more deeply. So let's check out what Dr. Ray says to those uh, questions. Let's talk about the importance of research for 
home education. And for those of us who love and want to protect home education, uh, National Home Education Research Institute is yeah. committed to that, to research, to knowing yeah. what is happening. Yes. Yeah. Why is that important? That's for what us? we do. Okay, so, so why is research important? All right, you you could have a belief in something. You could say, hey, I believe, you know, let's say you're a strong advocate. You speak up for Second Amendment rights, or or let's say you're a strong advocate. You're always speaking up for, you know, LGBTQ advancement. All these kinds of things. You know, you. Whatever your issue is, you know, whatever your thing is, and, and that's good. I mean, at the most fundamental level, philosophy and theology are the answer at the most fundamental level. However, we live in a world where there are politics and policies and opinions and people trying to make rules to control this group of people or that group of people. So empirical evidence that is honest, truthful, collected in a valid and reliable way are important is just inform how should we then live mm. in that sense. In this world in which we live, these legislators and policy makers and people who are in the education world, they want some evidence. They want some real evidence. So take this for example. If if your organization, let's say you're an advocacy organization of home education or parental rights, and you think there are 5,000 homeschool children in your state. You go, well, okay, that's interesting. Maybe that's one half of 1% of school age children. And, and if that's true, then, you know, maybe you, no one will care. Like, whatever, there's this little tiny group. Just leave them alone. Life goes on. They're a nothingness. They're a nobody. But if all of a sudden you say, it's not one half of 1%, it's, it's 1%, which doubled Maybe they didn't care before, but now maybe somebody cares. Yeah. Or if it went from, let's get more realistic, uh, in the United States, let's say it went from 4% of all school-aged children, which is now, that's, you know, that's quite a bit more than 30 years ago. That's a lot more than 30 years. But then if it went from 4% to 6% overnight, basically, you've got money, you've got taxes, you've got redistribution of wealth, how much of that goes to government schools, how much doesn't go to private schools? How much does not go to pro homeschooling? Wait a minute. Are the legislators going to lower your taxes next year? <laughs> no. <laughs> How did I see you say no? <laughs> you know, so, so hard evidence helps inform right thinking and right policy. Mm -hmm. You know, And it's the same kind of thing, Dr. McDill, with, with uh, research on academic achievement. Well, if, if it's true that home-educated children on average score you know 18 points below public school kids you kind of wonder well mm -hmm. wow policymakers are going to say well is this good for kids what's going on here is it is it worse for kids you right. know but if on the other hand home educated children are scoring on average 18 percentile points above public school kids should policymakers say hey this is good for kids let's try to get everybody to homeschool <laughs> you'd think <laughs> yeah what isn't that <laughs> i mean but that's so right evidence empirical evidence informs conversations mm -hmm. And so what do you think are some of the big issues now, uh, maybe threatening homeschooling, yeah. um, or uh, along those lines that research is gonna be important for, or some of the accusations about yeah. home education? Yeah, I think this, this question is related to why research anyway. Um, and, and one thing I wanna remind people is that in research, we are trying to assess reality and the truth. Research is about knowing the truth. And then, of course, truth is sort of defined by your presuppositions. But what we want to do is have accurate information, data-wise, factually, and then the conclusions and applications might vary more by your worldview. Mm -hmm. So we want to be accurate. And, and I don't want, you know, if it's true that last year there were 3.7 plus or minus million homeschooled children, if that's true, that's what I want out there. I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to underreport. Here's where we go now to what are some areas. Mm -hmm. I believe, and, and you can see this, as the homeschool world grows, that's the number of children in homeschooling and the number of families in homeschooling, people who have a fundamental presupposition that experts know better, people have a fundamental presupposition that somehow government-run schooling is better, or people who have 
uh, an affinity for a union that wants to protect their jobs, they're all going to be, one way or another, mm -hmm. biased against home education right. and home mm -hmm. education growing. And usually when somebody doesn't, does not like something to exist or to grow, they want to control it. And you're revealing that there has to be that motive besides academics because like you said, you would hope if they looked at the scores, homeschooling is working, great. Absolutely. Well now we have to know well, why are they not Absolutely. advocating and you've just identified that. Yeah, and I think this, this, here's a simple way I put it with, let's say those who say, well, I'm not for or against home education. I just want it to be all neutral and accurate. So, so let's say this, I go, well, we don't know for sure. We, don't, we do not have perfect studies, so we do not know for sure that homeschooled children do better academically. And I say, okay, so what if we did the perfect study and we could randomly assign 100 children to hum, homeschool for 12 years, randomly assign another 100 to private school for 12 years, randomly assign another 100 to public school for 12 years, and just let it rip for 12 years. And at the end, we found out there's no difference academically on standardized tests. What if they're all the same? Well, however, homeschooling did it without $14,000 per year mm -hmm. per child of tax <laughs> dollars. Homeschooling did it without yeah. government certified teachers. Homeschooling did it without that forced redistribution of wealth. That's an interesting story. Even if you had the perfect study. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you see that that draws out the worldview of the yep. other of the other people. Yeah, that draws out the worldview. So, you know, the ones who want to control homeschooling, they call it regulate. They they think yeah. that's a soft word, okay? But let's just face it, regulation is control. And so they'll say things like, "Well, we need to control homeschooling to make sure they're accountable." And then the question is, and your audience should ask, "Accountable to whom?" Mm. Well, they got to be accountable to the public. What's the public? Well, the state, I guess. Oh, really? Why do private schools have to be accountable to the state? Do Roman Catholic schools have to be accountable to the state? Do Muslim schools have to be accountable to the state? Do private, independent, mm. new age schools have to be accountable to the state? What's your theology behind that? What's your philosophy behind that? If you're a kind of a per-American history and liberty-loving, libertarian something, you don't argue that. But if you tend to be more of a statist, a uh, person who believes the state kind of first is in charge of your children mm -hmm. before you are, mm -hmm. then you're going to argue for that. So I think that's what we're watching for. We see more and more people, and they'll use this argument. Well, because once in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of time, some homeschool parents or some alleged homeschool parents do evil things to their children, see if we could only control homeschooling mm -hmm. more, evil things would never be done. Of course, that doesn't logically make any sense. We have children in America, we have over 50 million children in government public schools. And the latest research we have is that about 5 million of them will be sexually abused and mm. harassed by public school personnel by the time they graduate, even though they have all kinds of rules to control them. Mm. So that doesn't make sense. You know, and then we also hear, you could watch it the last year, many, many news articles, homeschooling's hurting public school funding wait a minute, how did you frame the title of that headline? Is homeschooling hurting public school funding or is homeschooling relieving the taxpayer? Which is it? <laughs> I, I think it depends on your worldview. Yeah. You know, if all of a sudden there are 10% fewer children in government public schools, does not the legislature next year say, hey, let's think about reducing property taxes by 10%, maybe. If it's a one-to-one well, -one ratio. that's what's interesting is that they don't necessarily assume that if you have less students, you spend less money. Cool. Why would you not? I don't, I don't <laughs> they think don't they don't even assume that. I don't think they do assume <laughs> that. All right. That was uh, Dr. Brian Ray from the National Home Education Research Institute. And if you'd like to read more uh, of his research on homeschooling and education uh, or support those efforts, you can go to NHERI. Org. So now I'd like to take a few minutes uh, for us to talk, talk about preserving our values through home education. I received a phone call from a dad uh, just a few months ago who had decided to homeschool, and then he told me his story. He had been watching his six year, uh, sixth grade daughter 
a daughter in the sixth grade, uh, during the pandemic at home, doing public school at home. And one of the conclusions that he and his wife made is that she didn't really get sixth grade education. She wasn't having all the schoolwork and everything that he thought would be uh, good for sixth grade. <clears throat> so he called up the principal and said, I would like my daughter to go through sixth grade again to make sure she has this foundation. Well, the principal said, no, she can't go through sixth grade again. She has to move forward. And the father said, well, I'm the dad and, and I want him, I, I want her to stay in sixth grade. And, and the principal continued to refuse. And that was what eventually caused the father to decide that I'm going to take responsible for my daughter's education. I'm going to pull her out. I'm going to make sure she has that foundation before she moves forward, which is a wise thing to do. Uh, we are at a really critical juncture in our culture. There is a great divide of worldview and of values. And uh, on one hand, uh, those set of values include the authority and responsibility of parents, such as this father, uh, who believes that that's his responsibility. Um, another part of those values is the traditional marriage between one man and one woman, freedom of speech and religion, the sanctity of unborn human life, and our constitutional government. On the other hand, there is a set of values uh, that looks more like this. Men and women can choose to be whatever gender they want and have sex with whatever gender they want. And if you disagree with that or speak out against that, then your free speech and your religion should be limited. Uh, this uh, viewpoint believes that traditional family isn't important, that killing unborn babies is a, woman, a woman's right, and that the government is primarily responsible for educating our children as opposed to parents. <clears throat> and finally, they believe that the Constitution is something that should be interpreted to fit into the times. So you can see the battle between these worldviews and, uh, and what's happening. And so here's the question. How can we preserve the constitutional Judeo-Christian values upon which this country was founded and in which we believe? Uh, one of the most important ways to do that is through educating our children. Uh, we believe, uh, North Carolinians for Home Education, we believe that home education is the best way that we can preserve our values through education today. It's not the only way, but it's the most effective way that we can continue to preserve our values. Um, uh, that is what we're here for. If you're interested in preserving those values, um, then I believe that you would want home education to be free and to thrive. And that's our mission, to help parents homeschool with confidence and joy. We do that in three ways. We protect the rights of parents to homeschool in North Carolina. We equip them with information and encouragement that they need. And we connect them with other parents and other homeschool groups in the state. And I, I want to reemphasize again the values. And we've articulated some of our most important values at NCHE. Uh, one of them, as I've mentioned, is parental authority. The authority and responsibility of educating and raising children belongs to parents. Uh, the second value that we articulate is, of course, home education. Home education is effective for establishing academic success, preparation for life, strong family relationships, and moral character. Uh, the third value that we prioritize is biblical Christianity. We operate uh, NCAG operates on the basis of biblical principles. We affirm the Nicene Creed, hold to the authority of Scripture for doctrine and practice, and seek to, to support Christian parents in helping their children follow Jesus Christ. Uh, finally, and this is an important addition to the one value I just said, is service to all. Uh, we serve and welcome uh, all who support home education, regardless of race or religious affiliation. So our board and our leadership and what we're doing comes from a Christian perspective. But we want to serve every single Christian, I mean, every single homeschool family, whether they're Christian or non-Christian or of another affiliation. Uh, we just want to make sure that everyone's right to homeschool is protected and everyone is equipped. If you believe that home education is an effective way to preserve our values, 
then it is in your interest and all of our interests to make sure that home education stays free and flourishes. And if you want to be a part of that, I want to ask you to partner with NCHE. There are two things you can do I'd like to ask you to do today to partner with us to help us uh, make sure that home education is free and growing and is um, going to be able to preserve our values. Number one, will you share this video with someone else that you believe also wants to support home education in this way for preserving our values? Values. Will you share it? Maybe a family member or a friend or someone else who's home uh, homeschooling. And the second, of course, is will you prayerfully consider making a financial contribution to North Carolinians for home education? Um, we are currently looking at a deficit in our 2021 budget. And here at the end of the year uh, in our fundraising campaign, we are trying to raise $20,000 so that we can meet, we can close that gap and, and meet those final uh, financial needs. So um, again, we're a nonprofit and our desire is just to serve uh, homeschoolers. And that's our desire. Um, it looks like our show's over, huh? Okay. Uh, as we uh, close it up, please continue to homeschool with confidence and joy. <laughs>